gathered here today at the United States Military Academy to honor a man who has held firm to the standards of the Army throughout his career and throughout his service for this country. As future leaders of the Army, you, the cadets at West Point, are charged with the same. To remain true to those values, those Army values, loyalty, duty, respect, honor, selfless service, integrity, and personal courage. And using these values to guide your soldiers into war, victory, and peace. General MacArthur's dedication to these values gave the Army a, mo a model for which to pursue. He led soldiers in World War I at the battlefields in France, at Champagne Marne and Saint Miel. He led the instructions of your predecessors at here at West Point, preparing them for the battles of Europe and the Pacific yet to come. Before the war, he was appointed leader of the American forces in the Philippines, becoming a symbol of hope for the people of that island nation, of those island nations. Becoming a symbol of hope. The Army promoted him for his efforts to the rank of Major General, the youngest in history to have ever done this. Soon after, they appointed him to the Army Chief of Staff, again, the youngest in history to do so. And soon war broke out in Europe and the Pacific, and General MacArthur was called on once again to lead in the Philippines. And as the impending takeover of those islands, MacArthur promised to those people, I came to Bataan and I shall return. And return he did. He led soldiers from island to island, capturing, recapturing land ceded to the Japanese. And on the 20th of October, 1944, he landed on the shores of the Philippines, fulfilling his off promise to those people, I have returned. After the war, he was tasked with rebuilding Japan. And when North Korea invaded South Korea, the Army called on General MacArthur once again, this time to spearhead the Korean effort as commander in chief of the United Nations Command, turning the tide of the war in favor of freedom. This is a transitional time for the Army. And General MacArthur is a mo General MacArthur is a model. He was victorious not because of where he was from, not because of who he was, but because of what he believed in. The world is changing. Decades of war and victory have established the United States as a beacon to the world, and the army must adapt. The times of Europe, the wars of Europe, the Pacific, and Korea are behind us. And now the army must adapt to peace, a hard fought and hard won peace, and the maintenance thereof. We must preserve the disciplined force we've created, and this can only happen through the values that we cherish. And we can look towards General MacArthur and his continued dedication to these values and to his country as the archetype for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to present the Sylvanus Thayer Award, and it is my great privilege to introduce to you General Douglas MacArthur. No human being could fail to be deeply moved by such a tribute as this. Coming from a profession I have served so long and a people I have, so, have loved so well, it fills me with an emotion I cannot express. 
But this award is not intended primarily to honor a personality, but to symbolize a great moral code, the code of conduct and chivalry of those who guard this beloved land of culture and ancient descent. That is the meaning of this medallion. For all eyes and for all time is an expression of the ethics of the American soldier. That I should be integrated in this way with so noble an ideal arouses a sense of pride and yet of humility which will be with me always. Duty, honor, country. These three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying points to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. But these are some of the things they do. They build your basic character, they mold you for future roles as the custodians of the nation's defense. They make you strong enough to know when you are weak and brave enough to face yourself when you are afraid. They teach you to be proud and unbending and honest failure, but humble and gentle in success. Not to substitute words for actions, nor to seek the path of comfort, or to face the strength and spur of difficulty and challenge. To learn to stand up in the storm, but to have compassion on those who fall. To master yourself before you seek to master others. To have a heart that is clean, a goal that is high. To learn to laugh, yet also never forget how to weep. To reach into the future, yet never neglect the past. To be serious, yet never to take yourself too seriously. To be modest so that you will remember the implicity of true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, the meekness of true strength. They create in your heart the sense of wonder, the unfailing hope of what next, and the joy and the inspiration of life. They teach you in this way to be an officer and a gentleman. Their story is known to all of you. It is the story of the American man at arms. My estimate of, of him was formed on the battlefield many years ago and has never changed. I regarded him then as I regard him now. As one of the world's noblest figures, not as one of the finest military characters, but also as one of the most stainless. His name and fame are the birth, birthright of every American citizen. In his youth and strength, his love and loyalty he gave, all that mortality can give. He needs no eulogy from me or from any other man. He has written his own history in red on his enemy's breast. But when I think of his patience in adversity, of his courage under fire, and of his modesty in victory, I am filled with an emotion of admiration I cannot put into words. He belongs to history as furnishing one of the greatest examples of successful patriotism. He belongs to the present, to us, by his virtues and by his achievements. In 20 campaigns, 100 battlefields, around 1,000 campfires, I have witnessed that enduring fortitude, that patriotic self-abnegation, and that invincible determination which carved the heart of his people. From one end of the world to the other, he has drained deep the chalice of courage. As I listened to these songs of the Glee Club, in memory's eyes, I could see those staggering columns of the First World War. I do not know the dignity of their birth, but I do know the glory of their death. They died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in their hearts, and on their lips the hope we would go into victory. Always for them, duty, honor, country. Always their blood and sweat and tears, we sought the way, the light, the truth. After 20 years on the other side of the globe, again the filthy, murky foxholes, those boiling suns of relentless heat, the bitterness of long separation from those loved and cherished, and the horror of stricken areas of war. Their resolute and determined defense, their swift and sure attack, their indomitable purpose, their complete and decisive victory, always victory, 
always through the bloody haze of the last reverberating shot, the vision of gaunt, ghastly men reverently following to the password of duty, honor, country. The soldier above all other men is required to practice the greatest act of religious training, sacrifice. In battle and in the face of danger and death, he discloses those divine attributes which his maker gave when he created man in his own image. No physical courage and no brute instinct can take the place of the divine help which alone can sustain him. However horrible the incidents of war may be, the soldier who is called upon to offer and to give his life to his country is the noblest development of mankind. You now face a new world, a world of change. And through all this welter of change and development, your mission remains fixed, determined, inviolable. It is to win our wars. Everything else in your professional career is but corollary to this vital dedication. All other public purposes, all other public projects, all public needs, great or small, will find others for accomplishment. But you are the ones who are trained to fight. Yours is the profession of arms. The will to win, the sure knowledge that in war there is no substitute victory. That if you lose, the nation will be destroyed. That the very obsession of your public service must be duty, honor, country. Others will debate the controversial issues which divide men's minds. But serene, calm, aloof, you stand as the nation's war guardian, as its lifeguard from the raging tides of international conflict, as its gladiator in the area of battle. For a century, you have def defended, guarded, and protected traditions of liberty and freedom, right, uh, of right and justice. Let civilian voices argue the merits or demerits of our process of government. Whether our strength is being sat by deficit financing, whether our personal liberties are as thorough and complete as they should be. These great national problems are not for your professional participation or military solution. Your guideposts stand out like a tenfold beacon in the night. Duty, honor, country. You are the leaven which binds together the entire fabric of our national system of defense. From your ranks come the great captains who hold the nation's destiny in their hands the moment the war talks and sounds. The long gray line has never failed us. Were you to do so, a million ghosts in all of drab, in brown khaki, in blue and gray, would rise from the white crosses, thundering those magic words, duty, honor, country. This does not mean that you are warmongers. On the contrary, the soldier above all other people prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. But, in, but always in our ears ring ominous words of Plato, the wisest of all philosophers. Only the dead have seen the war, seen the end of war. The shadows are lengthening for me. The twilight is here. My days of old have banished tone and tint. I listen vainly for the witching melody of faint bugles blowing revelry, of far drums beating a long roll. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry, the strange, mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, always I come back to West Point. Always there echoes and re-echoes duty, honor, country. Today marks my final roll call with you, but I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last conscious thoughts will be of the Corps. The Corps, the Corps. I bid you farewell.